he was widely regarded by his contemporaries, Washington in particular, as one of the most thoughtful and well-educated of the founding fathers. Mason is perhaps one of the most understated figures in U.S. history. Jefferson called him one of the greatest minds he had ever met, and Patrick Henry called him the greatest statesman and debater that he had ever seen or witnessed. George Mason influenced the three most important documents in U.S. history, the Constitution, Bill of Rights, and Declaration of Independence. He created and strengthened the blueprint for American rights as a whole, but his influence and ideas were not free from debate. At the Constitutional Convention of 1787, a group led by George Mason refused to sign the Constitution, taking issue with its flaws and calling for reformation, namely a Bill of Rights. The opposing side, unwilling to put in additional effort for changes they deem meaningless, wanted to refrain from altering the Constitution. Mason's objections were debated amongst the Founding Fathers. While some failed, through his exceptional diplomacy, many successful modifications made it to the final Constitution. These changes protected our basic freedoms in the long term. While the American Revolution got underway, Mason was the leader of the Virginia Patriots and later drafted the state's constitution. This constitution would later inspire his ideas for the federal constitution. When George Washington asked Mason to attend the constitutional convention, even with his worsening health, 12 children, and inclination to keep out of the limelight, out of a sense of duty, he went. During the convention, Mason was one of the most active debaters. It seems as though he had something to say on every topic. He was a pivotal speaker, forcefully presenting his point of view. Mason was finally in his element, accompanied by his intellectual peers. Their company seemed to energize him. No longer did he have to endure the mediocrity that added to his misery in the Virginia Assembly. Ratification, page 43. But when the drafted document came about, Mason was not pleased. Mason had a multitude of objections to the presented document. One, the Constitution did not include a Bill of Rights or declaration of any kind for preserving the liberty of the press. Two, senators had too much power, he said, given that they were chosen by state legislators and therefore not representatives of the people or amenable to them. Three, the House of Representatives was way too small, giving the people only a shadow of representation, and so on. So he, along with Edmund Randolph and Elbridge Gerry, two dissenters which we'll talk about later, refused to sign the Constitution despite Benjamin Franklin's plea. The three of them all had issues with the drafted Constitution. Randolph and Mason's objections coincided significantly. Mason's fears were a lot like Randolph's. Mason thought that the government under the Constitution would begin as a moderate aristocracy and then over time become a monarchy or a corrupt tyrannical aristocracy. Randolph predicted that the convention's plan of government would end in tyranny. Mason outlined his worries in the document Objections to the Proposed Federal Constitution. Washington received these objections in a letter and passed it on to other founding fathers. P.S. Having received in a letter from Colonel Mason a detail of his objections to the proposed constitution, I enclose you a copy of them. Washington's letter to James Madison. His objections were debated and rather ignored and shot down by other founding fathers. In a detailed letter, Madison outlined his arguments against the large majority of Mason's points. Washington, however, agreed that the flaws in the Constitution should be amended, but he argued that this should take place after ratification. I wish the Constitution had been made more perfect, but I sincerely believe that it is the best that could be obtained during this time. It opens a door for constitutional amendment hereafter, and so a way to remedy its imperfections in the future. George Washington. Thus, debate over whether changes should be made prior or post to ratification ensued, as well as discussion concerning the necessity of a Bill of Rights. A common reason attributed to why the Bill of Rights is absent in the original Constitution is a longing to go home. The Founding Fathers felt as though the Constitutional Convention was stretching out for far too long, and adding a Bill of Rights would just lengthen the process. Mason himself had a family of 12 to return to, yet he stayed until the end of the Convention. However, this certainly isn't the only reason. James Madison made the following points against incorporating the Bill of Rights into the Constitution. The idea of a Bill of Rights also felt quite foreign. At the time, there was a sheer scarcity of examples as to how a Bill of Rights could change and evolve. Thinking back to 1776, when Americans started writing constitutions at a state level, eight of those constitutions have Bills of Rights attached to them. However, in only two cases, 
were bills of rights actually incorporated into the text of the Constitution. And, in other states, they were thought of primarily as a set of principles. They weren't fully regarded as legally enforceable commands. The concept wasn't understood in the same way as it is today. This misunderstanding of what a function of a Bill of Rights was caused Federalists to believe it was a useless feature. A Bill of Rights was redundant at best and dangerous at worst. James Madison Using diplomacy, a compromise was made in the form of the Ninth Amendment proposed by George Mason. The enumeration in the Constitution of certain rights shall not be construed to deny or disparage others retained by the people. This aided Madison's initial fear of listing rights to be inherently limiting. After the Constitutional Convention was adjourned, it became clear that the Bill of Rights also seemed to be a major concern of the public. The War of Printed Words was a national debate that took place through essays and newspapers over whether or not the Constitution should be ratified. During this time, essays and critiques of the Constitution were published nationally, as well as documents of the dissenters Randolph, Mason, and Gary. It was one of the greatest outpourings of political writings in American history. Mason's objections to the proposed federal constitution was a major influence throughout the entire debate. A written declaration of rights was one of Mason's chief concerns. The Bill of Rights was mentioned again and again and again at ratifying conventions in essays, letters, etc. Madison was looking for ways to boost his support, to aid his possible campaign for public office in the future. Gaining faith in the idea of the Bill of Rights, he latched onto it, garnering support for both himself and the Bill of Rights simultaneously, a strategic campaign effort. However, unlike Mason, Madison opposed amendments before ratification. As a consequence of this, the first draft of the Constitution ultimately was ratified without a Bill of Rights, despite Mason's best efforts to prevent the Constitution from being ratified in his home state, Virginia. Some consider this as a failure for Mason, and that isn't entirely true. Though Mason favored editing the Constitution prior to ratification, at the end of the day, efforts were made to perfect the Constitution, and that's exactly what he wanted. After ratification, James Madison advocated for a Bill of Rights. Congress agreed on amendments to add, and the Bill of Rights was officially included in December 1791, ultimately a success for George Mason. Debate number two, before or after ratification. Another debate that seemed to be of critical concern to those at the convention was whether the constitution should be amended and perfected before or after ratification. It explains why the Bill of Rights was absent in the original document. Washington favored the notion of amending the constitution post to its ratification. Amongst the federal convention, dissenters such as Mason, Randolph, and Gary agreed that it would be better to repair the constitution earlier. Randolph says this way amendments could be adopted by the simple majority of the states and not the three quarters required to amend the constitution after it was ratified. And in the interest of stability, a constitution should be amended as little as possible post a ratification. Madison and Washington worried that this would form a paradox of sorts. They didn't want to give room to the public to propose amendments prior to the Constitution's ratification, as they feared they would compile an overwhelming amount and delay ratification significantly. Madison also opposed amendments before ratification because he feared they would cause serious contention among states and assist those who wanted to dissolve the Union. The debate split into two major sides, the Federalists and Anti-Federalists. The Federalists supported the ratification of the Constitution and then fixing its flaws, whether the Anti-Federalists wanted to fix the major flaws prior to ratification. To those who saw the Constitution as the country's only alternative to ruin, any opposition of its quick ratification was akin to treason, Pauline Mayer. But as more time passed, more began to realize that criticisms of the drafted constitution were valid and needed to be addressed. However, by the time ratifying conventions took place at a state level, while a large portion of the public was swayed by anti-federalist arguments, the preponderance still favored quick ratification to prevent the ruin they feared. So during the race for ratification, the federalists prevailed and received the quick ratification they wanted, but not free of criticism. George Mason, by advocating for a written declaration of rights, participating in debates, exchanging ideas, and diplomatically coming to compromises with his peers, earned his title as the father of the Bill of Rights. A series of debates that took place at the Constitutional Convention, the War of Printed Words, and state-level ratifying conventions all played a significant role in its adoption. Though it failed to make it to the first draft of the Constitution, the Bill of Rights has been protecting our basic rights and liberties since its ratification. Its impact was magnified in 1868 as a consequence of the 14th Amendment, which prohibits the states from violating people's life, liberty, or property without due process. Beginning in the 1920s, the Supreme Court began to apply the Bill of Rights to the states to fulfill the 14th Amendment's guarantee of liberty. Gradually, the Supreme Court has interpreted most of the provisions of the Bill of Rights to apply its limits on state and local governments through due process. The Bill of Rights became more useful and relevant to the people of America than it already was before. The Bill of Rights expanded its role, size, and purpose and played a stronger role in politics, society, and governing. This inevitably put it at the center stage once again for discussion amongst the American people. 
The Bill of Rights began with debate over its very existence. Perhaps it's fitting that it still brings about questions and controversy today.